Well, greetings, everyone. We're reporting out on a research study which my research partner, Amanda Haney, and I did a couple of years ago, and it's actually been published in a journal. What we are examining was looking at how do facilitators change their vocational identity as a result of their experience as serving as a study group leader. We were really focused not so much on do they do so. There's already been 60 other studies that are reported out that this phenomena occurs. The thing that we wanted to focus on was the why. It isn't so much that they make the decisions. We wanted to understand more about the why. And also we wanted to see whether there are any theory models out there that can help to explain this. If you want to read more about those 60 other studies, please go to this website here and you'll find a link to be able to take you to the annotated citations about those 60 other studies, many of which are available online. So you might want to go and pursue that on your own. For us, we were looking at 43 of our study group leaders, we call them facilitators here at the University of Minnesota, and applied very rigorous qualitative research procedures in order to analyze them, triangulate the data, and be able to see if we could come up with some findings. Well, four major themes emerged from our research. 20% of all of those facilitators had already decided they wanted to go into a teaching career they chose to become a facilitator, they said, because they thought it would be helpful to get a pre-teaching experience and to confirm that they really do want to become a teacher. So there was no changed outcome for them other than they had a higher confirmation level. 20% of the facilitators reported they now have new interest in a teaching degree. Well, that's a rather significant increase. 10% of them, well, they now have an interest of maybe teaching somewhere down their career. Many of the facilitators that we work with here at this Research One institution are going into graduate school. They see themselves as careers, as research scientists, and things like that. But now you've got 10% of them thinking, you know, maybe I'm going to make a shift later in life. And then five of them, well, 5% of them identified, well, this really has identified for them more teaching interest. Well, let's just kind of do the math here. That's 20 plus 10 plus 5. Well, that's 35%. That's one-third of the facilitators did not have an interest in teaching at the beginning of their experience as a facilitator now they are interested in pursuing that. That's a pretty major jump for a student who originally thought they wanted to go into graduate school and become a research scientist. Well, what are some of the things that seem to have an influence on them? Well, one of them is that there's obviously a differential of power inside of these facilitator sessions where they're placed into a responsibility as a leader and in leading discussion, putting together lesson plans and the rest. There's also positive feedback from the students back to them about the skill, about how they feel like they're helping them to be able to earn higher grades. Well, that positive feedback is having an influence because it's confirming for the facilitator, well, actually, they're pretty good in this role. Then you end up seeing that, let's take another one of them down here. They also have a lot of time for reflection, both through the team meetings and particularly through these weekly journals. It's one of the things that I've discovered in looking at the research. One of the most powerful things you can do to help students inside of my classes to lock in what it is that they've experienced for the week is for them to write about it and for them to make an interpretation and to integrate that into what they already know. The writing process is extremely important. It's really it's a catalyst for deeper thinking. And we think that that's also part of the reason why both in the journals as well as them talking with one another had an influence on them. So what's the implications out of all of this? Well, the thing that's pretty interesting is that 
being a facilitator and the role of the study group program is actually an incubator of all kinds of other co-curricular activities. There's a lot more going on inside of PAL sessions than them simply drawing a paycheck for running study review sessions so that those students who attend are going to get higher grades. Most facilitators, except for that 20% that chose to get in because they wanted to confirm their interest in teaching, most of them never thought about there's going to be something else that they were going to be able to experience. The peer facilitation program becomes kind of a laboratory for people to explore some vocational choices. Well, if we could be more intentional about that in the way we structured the program, well, that could have a deeper influence on students being able to make more solid choices. We know from the literature and the theories that it's a developmental process for people to choose an occupation. They may think that they know what they want to do whenever they enter college, but most of them don't have deep convictions about that. Serving as a facilitator is a great place for people to be able to make deeper decisions. And we really see this as a dynamic process for people to develop their vocational identity. And that's something you don't tend to see in the literature whenever you look at articles about peer learning programs. You look at them, a number of, like I said, 60 articles have said that, well, yeah, students say that they kind of thought about choosing a teaching career as a result. But whenever we talk about vocational identity, we're really talking about who they see as themselves. That's a really much deeper process. So what are some changes that could be made inside of campus peer study programs to kind of accentuate this catalyst experience for choosing and exploring with vocations? Or number one, they could integrate just a little bit of this into their initial trainings. We're not talking about a radical change here. We're not talking about hours and hours and hours of discussion about this. We're just simply suggesting that Maybe you could add 10 to 15 minutes of this to a two- or a three-day training workshop. Maybe you could end up adding in one required reading for them that maybe they discuss not at the initial training, but maybe they do that at one of those periodic uh, facilitator team meetings that happens throughout the academic term. You know, if you wanted to, you could actually invite someone to come in from career services just for a few minutes maybe 10 or 15 minutes, maybe not even that long. Simply bringing students' attention to this could make a real difference. I think it's also important for the staff members who monitor and manage and coach the program, well, they also, it'd be helpful if they studied this a little bit more and they see opportunities when they could bring it into the discussion. And then finally, the idea about reflections are really critical. We're not asking or suggesting to you that every single week that the journal ought to be about, now what are you thinking about for a future career? What are your vocational interests? We're thinking about, and for us, this is the way it worked, it is one time over the academic term. The students had to complete 10 of these journal entries and the suggestion is, well, maybe we have one of them, and I'd probably suggest towards the end of the academic term, that asks them to reflect about, well, now you've gone through this experience for two-thirds of the academic term. Does this seem to be clarifying for you or causing you to think about your vocational choices? That's all you have to do. Just to give them a space for them to be able to write about it and also maybe a space for the students to be able to talk about it for a few minutes during one of those periodic team meetings then. Like I said, you could actually broaden the scope of the program. Emphasize this is one of the benefits for you becoming a facilitator. So it's not just simply selling them that it's a good salary, it's an interesting experience, you get to work with people your own age. You could also talk about well, this is also a place for you to check out future vocational interests as well. Also, involve other people. 
like I said, career services, maybe a faculty member to come in, spend some time during the initial training, or come in for one of those team meetings and spend just a little bit of time. And that way, we are not only drawing on their expertise, but also you're building another partner who can be an advocate for why your peer learning program ought to have continued, if not expanded, funding. This whole idea about thinking about the peer learning program as a co-curricular venue, I think, is really critical. You know, funding decisions are becoming more and more difficult every single year. Why is it that the administrators are going to choose your program to continue or to expand funding in? It's really hard decisions for them. For everybody they say yes to, they probably have to say no to two or three others. And I think this is the true reality. We're not making up and saying that this thing could happen. Actually, it already is. And it draws attention to the administrators and particularly inside of student affairs, what kinds of things are happening as a positive in the side of these programs. And also, you could report some of this inside of your annual reports. It's an interesting way to portray your program. It's more than just simply numbers about how many students were served, uh, how many um, uh, people were able to have higher grades. Now you're talking about the benefit of the program, not only for the participants, but also for the facilitators. And I think that that is the right way to position your program because it really is doing these things. Well, Inside of this short little discussion here, there's not time to go any more deeply, but here are some places where you can learn more about peer learning programs, hear interviews with peer facilitators. You end up seeing here there is a a website that I maintain with lots of resources. We have a YouTube channel. We have a, a podcast, and as I said, we have interviews with some of the Uh, facilitators who talk about how has this program had an impact on them. Here's that bibliography I was talking about. And not only can you see those 60 studies, there's actually a total of 1,400 plus annotated citations and about 40 to 50 percent of them all have web links because they're up online then. And also, if you have any interest, we also have our own training notebook that we share. There's 200 pages inside of it. It's not perfect. There's other ones that have great activities that we never thought to include. But maybe you might find a few things inside of there that might be useful for integration in your own program. Be happy to talk with you on the phone. Please send an email. It's an exciting thing seeing these young people growing and changing as a result of their involvement. Thanks for listening.